Within the pages of the Bible itself, there is a God-given design for its study. Rightly dividing the word of truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us today for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, president of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. There really is only one person that can teach you God's Word. When I teach, you need to look and see, search and see, don't take it from me. You need to go to the Scriptures because the Spirit of God wrote His Word. And so the Spirit of God that wrote the Word has to be the one who teaches you in your inner man. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 9, Paul says, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Notice there are things that your eye and your ear and your heart can't perceive. Your eye is what you see. We call that empiricism. Your ear is what you hear. We call that reasoning. And, and your, your, your heart, man, with heart man believes. We call that faith. And with the eye, the eye gate empiricism, the scientific method of observation and rep, uh, repeatable uh, events, the, the ear gate, the, the gate of reason and ration and thinking, and the faith gate, the heart gate, with those things, the capacity you and I, we can't find out God. So then how would you know him? But God hath revealed. You see, God has made himself known to us. And the way he did it is by his spirit. It's the spirit of God that reveals God to us. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a, of, of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knows no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You see, God the Holy Spirit is the teacher. And to study God's Word, the first requirement, the first thing you have to do to understand the Scripture is to have confidence that you have the indwelling Holy Spirit of God as your indwelling resident teacher. Well, then the question comes, how can I know for sure that I have the Spirit of God dwelling in me? Well, come to Ephesians chapter number 1, because he wrote a verse of Scripture in the Bible just to answer that question. And it says nothing about what church you go to. It says nothing about what creed or confessional you uh, agree to or don't agree to. Anything about your religion. It doesn't say anything about your activity, what you, what you gave up, what you quit doing, what you started doing, how, how good you are, how bad you aren't. Listen to what he says. Ephesians 1, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. In whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In, which also, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which, uh, uh, Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest. I'm going to get the chalkboard out here because I don't want you to miss what this verse is saying. Notice, notice what he says here. In whom you also trusted. You've trusted in Christ. The last part of verse 12 it says, talks about those who first trusted in Christ. After that you heard the word of truth. So here's the order. First, you had to hear the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. You hear the gospel of your salvation. Then, in whom also, after, you, after that, after you heard, you did what? You believed. Well, what did you believe? Well, you believed the gospel, the gospel of your salvation. Now, what happens after you hear God's word? Here comes the Spirit of God with his word. He wrote the word. You believe it. You give that positive response to the, to the doc. What happens? Well, after you believe it, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You're sealed, and notice it says, not by, but with the Holy Spirit is what seal is who seals you you're sealed with the holy spirit he literally comes and implants himself into your spirit 
and becomes the earnest of our inheritance. He becomes the down payment of our eternal life. We hear the word, we hear the gospel of your salvation, you believe the word, and when you believe it, then you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. So how do you know, how can you know for absolute sure and confident that you have the proper indwelling resident teacher of God's word? Well, you know it objectively. You don't have to say, well, I, I, I believe my church is the right church. Or, Brother Rick, I go to church and I tithe. And, Brother Rick, I don't do that. You don't have any of that kind of stuff. All that's subjective. All of that is something that may or may not be just your opinion or somebody else like you's opinion. And you know what they say about opinions. They're like armpits. Everybody's got two of them and none of them, none of them are, well, anyway. You hear, the, you hear the gospel. You believe the gospel. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. How can you have confidence that you have the indwelling Holy Spirit? Well, you hear the gospel. You believe the gospel and you're sealed. What is that gospel that when you hear it and believe it causes the Holy Spirit to come in and seal you. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Apostle Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, writing to the Corinthians, says, Moreover, brethren, I, I declare unto you that gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which you are saved. Here's the gospel that when you hear it and believe it, it saves you. The Holy Spirit then seals you. You're sealed with the, with the Holy Spirit. What is that gospel? Verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, and he was buried, and he was raised again the third day according to the Scripture. Notice there are four or five things there. Number one, he died for our sins. You know what that means? That means you're a sinner. That means sin separates you from God. Listen, you can go to church all your life and try to convince everybody in the world that you're okay and that you're really not as bad a guy as everybody thinks you are and, and, and you know, all that kind of business. You can look around any room you go in, you can find somebody better, you know, worse than you are, and you can point out, point them. Problem with that is, when you compare yourself among yourself, keep looking around that room, you find somebody better than you. They're pointing at you, that you're not good as they are. You know what the book says? The book says there's not a just man that on, on the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Friend, it's not comparing you with me or me with you or us with somebody else or somebody else with us. It's comparing you with God. You're not as perfect as Jesus Christ, and you know it. Well, if you're going to go to heaven when you die, you have to be perfect, and you know that, and you aren't. So the first thing in the good news is really bad news, is that we, we've got some sin that needs to be dealt with, and the wages of sin is death. That's what comes because of your sin. So the first thing I believe when I hear the gospel is that I'm a sinner and my sin separates me from God. And then he says that Christ died for my sins. Jesus Christ did what? The wage of sin is death. The only answer for death is life. So Jesus Christ does what? God commends his love toward us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Notice what that verse says. While we were yet sinners. That means you weren't trying to make it better. You weren't trying to fix it. You weren't trying to get it. You, you, know, you, you weren't trying to repent and show God how, how sorry you were. You were going on in your merry way. Your sinful, rebellious, self-interested way. Living in your own autonomy. Doing it your way. Not caring about anything anybody else said. And when they said something, rebel against it. Make excuses for it. And in your condition of being a rebel against God, helpless, hopeless rebel, he says in that passage in Romans 5 that in due time Christ died for the ungodly. He says, did you get that? When we were without strength, he died for the ungodly. Couldn't help ourselves. When we were yet, yet sinners, what's he do? He dies. He pays for your sin debt. You want to know where the love of God is? The love of God is, if you want to see God's love, look to Calvary. Don't look to your bank account. Don't look to the status of your health or your romantic life. Don't look how the world or somebody else is treating you. Look to the cross. That's where God demonstrates, has demonstrated, 2,000 years ago in the objective reality of human event, prove without any question that he loved you by coming to Calvary and paying your sin debt. The guilt, the shame, the penalty, 
and all the rest for your sin, he paid for it at Calvary. Christ died for our sins. Then it says he was buried. When it says he's buried, it means two things. It means, number one, he was really dead. This is not a figment of imagination. This is not some, some swooning hallucination of some religious figure. He was dead, stone cold, dead on the market. Boom. It's reality. But when they buried him, they took him out of the way. That pictures the fact that Jesus Christ took our sins away. They're done away with, put out of sight, out of God's sight, out of our sight, and then he was raised, there's life. There's forgiveness right there, paid for him. There's life. You see, the only answer for death is life, and there you have it. You know what that is? He says he was raised for our justification. That means it's paid in full. That's what that means. You ever go pay for gas at the gas pump, put your credit card in, when you get through, they say, you want a receipt? And you say, yes, and you get the receipt, and the receipt says, I paid for it. I'm not a drive away, I paid for it. Got proof. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is proof, historically demonstrated in the reality of human event, that his death put away sin. If he hadn't completely put away all of your sins, death would have held him. When he came up from the dead, that proved the receipt that's paid in full. And now, he can be, now you can trust him to be your life. Now when you trust and you believe the gospel of your salvation, you believe that Jesus Christ died because you were a sinner and your sin separated you from God, going to put you in hell in the lake of fire for eternity. But Jesus, God commended his love toward us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He put away our sin by the sacrifice of himself and he was raised to give us his life. When you trust him to be the Savior, he died and rose again to be. The moment you do that, God, the Holy Spirit, comes and seals you with himself. You know how you can know for sure you have the real teacher of the Word of God? You have the real teacher because you believe the gospel of your salvation. Your faith is resting in what God says, not what you do. So the first issue is that God requires for understanding his Word is to acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you can't save yourself, realize that the payment must be made for your sin, and that Jesus Christ at Calvary died to pay the penalty for your sins in, the, in his blood on the cross, and then you simply rely, you believe, you rely exclusively on him to be the Savior. You rely exclusively on his death, burial, and resurrection to be your complete payment total payment for your sins, and your only hope of, of having eternal life as a present possession and in heaven. And once you've done that, God gives you his Holy Spirit to indwell you, and that Holy Spirit then is the teacher of his word.